All right, so Sebastian, we're going to get started. The next speaker is Sebastian Kammerer from NVIDIA. In an application-driven coding theory workshop, we have a speaker from the company that's driving most of the applications that people seem to be caring about in the world. So thank you, Sebastian, and we look forward to your talk. Please take it away. Yeah, great. Thanks for the nice words. Um, and um, sorry for not being there uh, present. Uh, but it's it's a it's great to present our work here on graph neural networks or machine learning uh, for classical and quantum uh, coding or decoding, and um, yeah. So let me quickly get to the topic. So um, if you think about graphs in, in, in general and wireless communications, they are everywhere, right? So we have graphs for resource allocation, we have graphs for multi-user MIMO detection, and of course we also have codes on graphs. So many of, of today's codes are actually defined or can be defined over over graphs and the decoders are, uh, it's, it's natural to have graph-based decoders for say 5G LDPC codes and, and other codes. So this work is about understanding actually can we use graph neural networks for applications and wireless and uh, the particular use case here is um, in general coding. And um, the second part of the talk, I will actually show how we can apply that to quantum error correction, which gives us some some tough challenges for the for the graph neural network, and um, see, we need a couple of tweaks to make it work essentially. Okay, so I, I think it's a coding workshop, so I don't need to um, go into the very basics, but just to clarify the terminology, we denote the the um, information bits by B and the code word bits by 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 C, and then the problem or the task of channel of encoding is essentially that we encode k information bits into n code word bits essentially. Um, the problem from machine learning perspective is that there's a curse of dimensionality. So only k bits lead to actually two to the power of k code words. So if you train neural networks to learn how to decode, now you either have an architecture that somehow implicitly knows that we are dealing with linear codes, or you will actually run into this problem of having a, a exponential training complexity if the network does not know by its architecture or by some additional knowledge that we have uh, linear codes. So the idea is actually to use these um, graphs or graph-based um, neural networks that can now implicitly learn the graph structure. So without having this or kind of avoiding this exponential training complexity by training the networks directly on the graph. And we will see how this works in the next few slides here. And I think everyone knows we can define, um, can have Tanner graphs and derive Tanner graph and parity check matrices. So I think that's well known. So that, that the idea is actually to replace the channel decoder by a neural network-based decoder. For that, we make use of so-called message passing graph neural networks. And um, it's similar to BP decoding. Essentially, the idea is that we iteratively send messages over our graph. So this would be the Tanner graph of, um, of the code. Um, but there are a couple of things that are different compared to, let's say, belief propagation or classical BP decoding that we know from channel coding. Um, so the principle is that we have um, these nodes, so check variable nodes if you want, and they, rep they represent now um, vectors essentially, so, so high dimensional features, feature vectors, we call it H. In practice, that turns out to be 20 is actually a good number. So we have a 20 dimensional vector instead of scalar look like good ratios. That's sometimes also called the blessing of dimensionality, by the way. So instead of the curse, you can also have the blessing of dimensionality. And then um, we exchange messages um, over this over all edges of the graph, and we denote the messages by M, and they are also um, some higher dimensional feature vectors. Um, at each node, what we do is actually we do a so-called aggregation and see there are different aggregation functions where we aggregate the messages and then based on the, the aggregate of messages, we update the node values and then we iteratively repeat that until we have actually convergent or any other stopping condition. Now, a few details about this. Um, so the first step, we update all messages for, for edges essentially. And for that, we take the first MLP. So MLP here can be any trainable structure. In practice, we use a dense, just a fully connected neural network, two layers, and that's it. And the input is actually, now for every edge, is actually the, the value of the node where the edge starts and the value of the node where the edge ends. We concatenate that, feed it into an MLP, and then we have some trainable parameters denoted by theta m. These are the parameters that we optimize when we do gradient descent. And in practice, these are only a few thousand parameters. So these are very small networks and they are shared for all node updates. So all nodes in the graph, they use exactly the same uh, MLP here. Then we aggregate messages and the aggregation function can be actually 
So at every node, we, we just look at all incoming um, edge messages, we aggregate them and generate one aggregated state essentially. And that um, can be any, any um, aggregation function that's permutation invariant. So that can be a summation, that can be the mean, that can be also max or min operation. In practice, actually what we're using is the mean operation. Um, and then the last step actually is that we update the value of a node. So the node update function, where we take the previous value of the node, so the current state, if you want, we concatenate it with this aggregated um, message vector we've just calculated before, feed it into another NLP, and then we, we train this network to produce an output state, which is then the updated state of this node. And we do that for all nodes and all edges in parallel. And then we kind of iteratively repeat this procedure here until we have, let's say, 10, 20 iterations, whatever. And then if you look at the trainable parameters of this network, we have one MLP that has that does the edge updates and one MLP that does the node updates, but they are shared across all nodes and across all edges. Uh, for, by, for the sake of decoding, so that's a very general description of a message passing gene. And we do one uh, extension here that we have specific MLPs for the check node updates and specific MLPs for the variable node updates. So we have actually two types of, of node updates and also for the, for the um, messages that we sent over the address here. We have two different, so two, depending on the direction, we take a different MLP. So in total, we have four trainable MLPs. Each of them has roughly 2,000, 3,000 trainable parameters. So it's super small. All right. Then talking about the training. Um, so we need to train that now. So we do- Sorry, just a quick question. Node. Hello? Yeah. Uh, what are, in this paper, what exactly are the node features? What kind of information uh, is in, encoded in the nodes? And do you- do you We see that in nodes? a second. Uh, um, oh, you're going to talk about just, it. Uh, let me just go through the procedure, how it works, and then um, but it's a good question. Yeah, that's actually one challenge. Understanding what exactly is the what the network learns is actually really not so trivial. Okay. Uh, but okay. yeah, give me give me one second. Um, so for the training, we do kind of loop unrolling, and then we kind of it's everything is differentiable, so we can essentially uh, just optimize these MLPs and uh, using standard gradient descent techniques here. Um, now let's talk about initialization. I think that's a bit related to the question. Um, so how do we initialize that? How do we initialize the node states? And for that, we use the so-called input embedding. So we take the LLRs for each um, variable node, essentially, and project it to this high-dimensional feature space. And we do that by a trainable input embedding. So we just multiply by a, by a trainable um, vector here. So it's W. So it's, typically, it's, it's 20-dimensional. And in our experiments, 20 was actually a good number. It can be 30, it can be 10. Uh, depends. And um, the interesting thing is actually you, you do not add information by that, right? So you, you just have a log likelihood ratio, a scalar value, you project it to some high dimensional space, but it helps or that makes the, 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 the training task for the network simple essentially. But from a, let's say, information threat perspective, I would say it, it does not change the the, um, the content of information. And we do that for all of the variable nodes. Uh, you can initialize the check nodes as well, but you cannot set it to zero because in the first step, uh, we initialize it to zero. That's easy, that's most trivial initialization. Then we repeat that the node updates for a couple of iterations. And then at the output, we do the same kind of the inverse operation. So we project these high dimensional features uh, vectors back to a scalar log likelihood ratios here. And that's actually used to calculate that the binary cross entropy loss um, between at the output here and, uh, and the labels, so the ground truth information. That's yeah, one thing is it, you cannot train that using the all zero code word. That's one one constraint that we have here, uh, or a limitation of this concept, because otherwise the network would always return uh, constant LLRs essentially. So that does not work. Okay, so we have two additional trainable parameters, but these are really just forty trainable parameters. That's almost nothing. For the loss, we just use the binary cross entropy loss. Um, average over all code word bits and over all iterations, so-called multi-loss. So it helps to actually that the convergence is more stable if you kind of average the, the loss across all iterations. You could also just take the final output, but it, it turns out to, to be less stable. And you can then later, not, you, we want later change the number of iterations and want to be flexible so that that really helps you. See an experiment in a second. All right, so let's look at the results. Um, and we have done first experiments using BCH codes, so very short codes here. We trade for eight iterations, but using the multi-loss, and we have only 10,000 trainable parameters, 9,600 trainable parameters. Um, now, as a ba uh, baseline, we have BP decoding, 20 iterations. We use uh, weighted belief propagation, 
see kind of a certain performance gain here. And we also have a, a baseline that's called ECC transformer, um, which is has far more weights. So it's actually a syndrome based approach has like, I think roughly a million weights uh, compared to our 10,000 weights. So it's a completely different direction of machine learning and also scalability is, is different here, but it tells us also that there is room for improvement essentially. Now, if you look at the GNM results, um, the surprising result is actually that the convergence is much faster. So we can, after three iterations, we actually outperform BP after 20 iterations. So that's one observation. And then we see there's a certain saturation. So after, let's say, eight to 10 iterations, there's almost no additional gain. So we could do it for, for 12 or 14, but then, um, yeah, the gains actually, the, the, the performance saturates at a certain point. So that's the that's kind of the first, first um, promising result here. Um, one remark is actually that even though the number of it, uh, parameters is quite small, the complexity is still high. We have a lot of MLP evaluations when we do the, um, so when we, for every node in the graph on every patch update as well, we need to kind of query one MLP. And that's kind of super, in terms of computational complexity, it's high complex, but the number of iterations is actually smaller. So we kind of trade the complexity versus number of iterations here. Okay, but it's a um, first good result. So let's quickly compare that to classical BP decoding. So similarities, we have the same decoding graph. That's good because we can also scale to large graphs and we, can, we know how to initialize or how the graphs actually given. And we use the same scheduling so we could use also um, layered decoding and things like that. So that's um, kind of agnostic to, to the GNN. Uh, there are a couple of differences. Um, so first of all, of course, we have these high dimensional messages, so 20 dimensional features. We have possibly non-extrinsic messages. So we don't know exactly what the network learns and that's a bit the challenge, right? So we train a network. It's There is no extrinsic, no rule that messages are extrinsic. We have don't have that in the loss, but for some reason it works very well if we train a network. It's hard to analyze that actually. And then um, one thing that I haven't talked about is actually we could also add node and edge attributes. So at every node, we could add some additional trainable parameters that could be really node specific. So at the moment, the MLPs are just specific for check or variable nodes, but we could really have per edge or per node in the graph could have additional trainable parameters. That's a bit similar to what is done in weighted BP, so no belief propagation. Um, and then we could also learn some short cycles or things like that. But in our practical experiments, there was no gain, so we have not used that for, for the final results, essentially. And then the other problem is that um, the graphs or the, the result of the, of the training is actually graph dependent, and that's quite quite a challenge. So if you change the code, we see that in a second, then we need to retrain the network, and that's something um, still is still an investigation, essentially. So let's quickly look in the um, results from an architecture search. So we did kind of a yeah, not brute force, a smart brute force search, um, evaluated a lot of different models, different parameters that we do training to optimize the hyperparameters. And a couple of, of, of interesting insights. So first of all, um, talking about the activations. So it turns out that the hyperbolic tangents actually performs or tends to perform better, which is actually a bit also aligned to what we do in, in the check note function of BP decoding. So I find that interesting. Um, so that's, that's aligned to what we do in BP decoding. Um, it turns out that the number of layers is actually relatively small. So you can have two or three layers and that's sufficient. You see no gains if you increase the number of, of layers further. Um, mean aggregation is more stable. I guess intuitively it makes sense if you have different node degrees and you do an aggregation, it's good to kind of take the mean instead of the sum. And um, yeah, the rest is quite straightforward here. So can I ask right. one more question? Sorry. Yeah, sure. Um, people in the, in the graph neural network community have started to move away from these heterogeneous graphs like the bipartite graphs and more into hypergraph neural networks. Did you try comp using hypergraph neural networks with, for example, set transformers or anything like that? Because no. then you can capture no, no, the whole uh... check in combination with the uh, variable nodes involved in the check. No, we, we haven't done that. So I, I cannot really comment on the performance. Okay. Yeah, thanks. All right, and then now um, let's let's look a bit more into practical applications. So into LPC codes, uh, we did one experiment for three six LPC codes, so regular codes, but not really optimal for BP decoding. Um, but it's easy to change the, the the length here. So we took like random codes, random code construction, um, 
knowing that this is not a super strong code, by the way, and um, just did the same. Now we trained for our first experiment we did, we took the same weights from the BCH codes and applied it to the 3.6 code. And it actually it's the orange curve. You see the performance is horrible. So that's kind of a bit of a, it's kind of the downside here that it's not forward. Uh, it's, it, there's no universality with respect to different codes. But then we trained it for, for N equals 100. And evaluated for 500 and, and, and 1000. So for different code lengths, essentially, same degree profile and seems to work quite well. So the gains are more or less the same here, depending it's independent of the length. And that's quite encouraging. And that's um, a network now. Keep in mind, this is a learned solution that scales to, let's say, hundreds or thousands of bits. Now, the next obvious thing is, of course, does it work for the 5G codes and how is the performance? So we did that as well. Um, for very short codes, we see small gains. So we have trained it here for 140 bits, um, rate 0.43. We see small gains, but it's really, yeah, super small. And given that the complexity is higher, I think it's it's not really a big breakthrough here. Um, but the interesting thing is that we can just change now the, the lifting of the code. So we can also apply it to longer codes without retraining. So you see that the that the network still works and we can also change the rate up to some extent so as long as we have the same base graph it seems to work quite well um so the right figure on the right hand side is actually without retraining so we change the rate of the code here and that seems to work well but i mean the gains are not really there so maybe 5g codes are really optimized for bp decoding and then there's not much that you can learn there's not much that you can improve by learning which is also a nice result essentially so we know that our classical solution works sufficiently well i would say and it's also kind of plausible right so um let me spend the second part of this talk on applying this to quantum ldpc codes because there are, there are quite some challenges and, and maybe the classical solutions are not that uh, good so there's still more room for improvement and we have now done all the experiments in the classical world which was good to also understand a bit the concept of, of gnns and now thinking about applying it to some some other uh, domain um, I have to admit I'm not a quantum expert, so um, we did that together with um, ETH, so it was a nice collaboration, and um, applied it to quantum CSS LDPC codes, and we focus on depolarization channels, so that's really a, a simple um, sort of model here. And in my words, the, the big problem of, of quantum is actually that we need to correct without measuring the qubits, so we need to correct the errors without accessing the or doing measurements, because otherwise the, the quantum states would actually destroy the quantum states. So what we do is we do use the stabilizer codes, which means in coding language that we have only access to the syndrome and we need to decode based on having a, having a measured syndrome. There are a couple of other things. Um, so we have different type of errors now. We have X, Y, and C type of errors, whereas Y is actually just a combination of X and C. So that makes it um, essentially we focus on X and C type of, of errors, which kind of gives us this a new structure of the parity check matrix. Um, and the other thing we mentioned that we, we look at the syndrome, so we have actually just access to the check node states, or it's what we measure. So it's it's not exactly the same as in a classical world, and we need to adjust our GNN here a bit to kind of learn this here, uh, type of task as well. But from a, let's say, a more um, engineering perspective, it's, it's actually also a very exciting and, and challenging um, thing. So we have some new um, code constraints, we have short uh, typically a girth, which is actually quite small. We have some cycles that are uh, four cycles that are given. So it, it makes the BP decoding actually worse, which is good because it makes the, the, the challenge for us more, more exciting, essentially, and, and we can see the performance of the GNN here. Um, we see it in a second, actually. All right, so we use a BP4, a quarterly BP decoder here as a baseline. So just as known in research. There are other um, solutions, by the way, also based on machine learning. There's the, there's a highly cited work on neural belief propagation for quantum codes already five years ago, uh, which is also a learning-based solution over the graph. So there's there are clearly some similarities here. So when you apply that, um, the naive version of that, of course, uh, let me explain the, the figure here first. So we have BP4, that's kind of the baseline. It has a pretty high error flow, essentially. And we applied the same concept of, of the GNNs. We trained it on our um, on, the, on a new code here, on the CSS code. And the performance is actually not that great. So see, we are even behind BP. Um, the problem is there are a couple of challenges when you train this. So we have now the syndrome. So we need to kind of 
we do is for the training, we, we change the, the, the error weight of the syndrome. So we start with a small weight and then increase it. It seems to be super unstable. Scaling this to longer codes becomes actually a challenge. So it seems to not scale super well. So if you have very short graphs, it, it works, but then scaling, it does not work well. So all this is not really a, a great solution. And in literature, there are much better solutions. So there's actually BP4 with an OSD post-processing. And if you see actually, it's orders of magnitude better. Now there are also other mechanisms um, like essential perturbation techniques. There's random perturbation, has feedback, see it on the next slide and more detailed, um, which all give much better performance than the classical BP, but they are kind of variants of BP. So we thought of maybe there's a, can maybe make use of that and embed that somehow in the gen and now we can learn this perturbation technique. So um, let's have a look at these, these different um, techniques. So let's look around. Um, and all these techniques, they work somehow similar. So you use classical BP, so BP4 decoding, a quaternary BP, that you do some perturbation, some, some perturbation of the LLRs essentially, and then you run another iterate or a couple of iterations of, of BP decoding, you might repeat that for a while. So you tweak the LLRs essentially by using different techniques. There is a, this random perturbation, which just to yeah, randomly perturb some non-fulfilled checks, you can improve that in a bit more um, um, smarter way of, of doing these uh, perturbations. You can also extend the parity check measures and so on. But it's always the same same concept. And now the question is, can we just use the GNN to just learn these perturbations? And um, it's kind of the inspiration to enhance feedback paper. So that's why we call it a feedback GNN. It's kind of the, the background. That gives us this hybrid BP GNN architecture where we have BP decoder, which is by the way differentiable. So all operations are differentiable. And we have in between one layer of the of the GNN, and then we can kind of repeat that a couple of times. We can do that iteratively. So that's the architecture. Um, it's really the same code base as what we have used before, except that we do the first half iteration actually even using the, the classical BP decoder. So the scalar messages and then only the second half. So the check to variable node messages are actually done using the MLP. It's just half and half iteration using the GNN essentially. And then we repeat BP iterations. And then again, and uh, can we kind of optimize that to can do four GNN iterations, four BP iterations and so on. Um, the nice thing is that this is fully differentiable. I mentioned this, so we kind of calculate the soft syndrome, calculate the binary cross entropy loss, and then we can just back propagate the gradients and train our small MLPs here. And now we have even less MLPs, so this entire network has only 4,000 trainable parameters. So that's super, super small. So let's have a look at the performance now. Um, training is actually super fast, it takes like 15 minutes or so. Um, we are much better now. So we have different versions. So one version is actually do 64 BP iterations, then one GNN layer, and then 64 BP iterations. Gives us the kind of pink curve here, which is already pretty good. But we get even better performance if we have multiple of these GNN layers here. So this is the kind of the architecture that's now shown here in the, in the figure. Um, and the thing is now we really need less significantly less iterations compared to the classical baselines, which have, at least in the worst case, they need a lot of BP iterations because they do many of these perturbation uh, attempts here. So like several thousands of iterations while the GNN actually converges in like a hundred iterations. Roughly. So that's, that's much better, but there is still an error flow that we would like to avoid. And if you think about why we have this error flow, then there is one problem that kind of these, these errors, they're really underrepresented in the training. If you look at the, the block error rates here, this happens with the probability of 10 to minus five, six. So um, the, the probability that during the training, we see one of these error flow cases is actually super unlikely. And we can of course train for a very long time, but it's super inefficient. So what we do is we, we, we look into an optimized training strategy of this network now. And for that, um, the idea is that we do a two-stage training approach. So we first train a network, 15 minutes of training. And then we use the trained network to collect the data set that we then use to fine tune the network only on these, let's say, hard to decode samples. So we have the second data set. Um, and then we do this fine tuning and push the performance. So we can really push the error flow by orders of magnitude down. So let's look at the performance. We have it here. So that's not a final performance. We are actually, yeah, it's a factor, I would say at least a factor of 10 lower than before by using this optimized training. And I'm not sure if that's really the, the final um, 
that's the best possible um, outcome. You could probably then redo this. You could even iteratively do this uh, multi-stage training procedure. So you collect another data set and then you decode again and so on. So maybe you can even push the performance further. So I don't think that is a fundamental limit at the moment here. Yeah, um, with that, I'm pretty much at the end of my talk. So let me quickly summarize. Um, first of all, we can learn to decode linear codes and um, it actually scales quite well. Um, and we use these the graphs, so we learn over the graph essentially. Um, we need, typically we tend to need less decoding iterations um, compared to classical BP, at least for some codes. Um, but we should also not oversell the results. So we have a high computational complexity, um, still have a lot of NLPs, a lot of um, uh, computations are required to decode. Um, on the other hand, it depends on the application. If we focus on, on quad, um, quantum decoding, um, might be totally okay to have this to spend the computational complexity here. Um, for quantum, um, the naive work very well. That does not necessarily mean it does not work, but at least we didn't manage to train this network. Uh, it seems to work much better if we combine it with, let's say, classical BP decoding, and we get this super nice um, performance. Still, the error flow is a challenge um, when compared to BP with OSD. There is still room for improvement. So we know that there are solutions that work better. We simply haven't found the best, uh, I don't know, training strategy, network architecture. So there might be even, there might be even some room for improvement. But still, if you compare it now in terms of the uh, complexity, I think in terms of uh, OSD is also is also challenging to implement for these type of codes. And then some open research question, of course, questions, could we learn a universal decoder? So maybe we mixed different um, training samples during the training to learn kind of one use universal decoding function, at least a, a pre-trained um, GNN that can be used for arbitrary codes. And then it's only fine-tuned maybe for a specific code. That would be one, one, one idea. Um, I still would like to understand the effect of attributes. So maybe we could also learn some code-specific um, parameters, properties, uh, like, Identify, use it to, to prune graphs. Similar things have been done for weighted BP. Um, so maybe there's some 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 in, insight to, to be gained. And um, the big challenge when we talk now about quantum is probably the inference latency because these systems are typically quite unstable. So you need to kind of run these decoders in, in a millisecond um, time scale, which is um, something one would really need to optimize now the, the architecture for. Yeah, with that, I'm at the end. Um, all of our experiments are online available, so you can just reproduce them. You can run them online. All of that is, is, is available as open source. Um, so the classical and the quantum experiments. Yeah, with that, um, we'd be happy about questions. So we have time for a couple of questions. Oh, we'll Thanks for the talk. Uh, can you go back to the error floor slides? It's very interesting. I wanted to get so so when i i'm more from the quantum side when i think about this is i want to be at 10 minus 10 at least right for logical error rates so if you have if you want to keep each magnitude right you want to reduce by you need to get more and more novel errors right less and less likely errors so how do you also expect the like the difficulty of collecting that data set to scale as you want to push that error floor lower and lo lower uh, it's 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 math now if it takes one day at a certain error rate and you are 10 times lower it takes 10 days right so um but i have to say we, we're doing it on a, on a single gpu so the experiments are really it's not from a computational complexity i think there's it's not like that you need a supercomputer at the moment to do all of these experiments so i think there's still room to to um push the error flow down but the point is i don't know if there's a fundamental limit at a certain point that's something i don't know i don't know if it's a training or if there's really a limit um where you can simply where data does not help or training does not help anymore that's the point that we don't know we just observe if we do this fine tuning we can actually push the error flow um, yeah but you could you could parallelize that you could run it on i don't know on, on, on 10 gpus and then you get 10 times more data in the same amount of time essentially Okay, thank you. We have another question. So, the Sebastian doesn't.
So uh, thanks for the for the talk. So I, I want to mirror what Olgica has said. I you know I think the big advantage that you have if you do training, and the, the hope why you might be able to do better BP for short lengths is exactly that you can learn something about the cycle structure and so on, right? But for this, you definitely would need to take bigger neighborhoods into account, right? So they're generalized BPs or what you know whatever thing, right? So the, I see no reason why you should constrain yourself to just you know, stay with the same graph and not just take bigger neighborhoods into account, right? We'll take a little bit more training, but then you can really hope to do better. And also the airflow, you might directly be able to, at, um, to attract because, you know, four cycles, they're, I mean, they're very small, right? You don't need huge neighborhoods, right? So I think you could do much better by doing this. On the other hand, I think the other thing from, you mentioned universe, the universal training, I in my feeling, it this doesn't make sense. Because if you want something that's universal, it would also have to work for long lengths. And we know that PP is optimum for large lengths, right? So you cannot hope to do something universal that's good. The, 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 the exact hope is that you do well for very specific codes, but this, by definition, has to depend on the code. So, you know, there I just don't see how you could hope. Uh, yeah, maybe a comment. Um, so, so, so maybe that's a right, the wrong formulation in a sense. So universal decoding, it would be good to have one good starting point, essentially. So we, instead of starting with a randomly initialized network that does not work at all, you could have one universal decoder that works for different types of codes, but is not optimal. So you could then use this as a starting point and optimize in one direction or in the other direction. That would be an interesting experiment. I don't know if it works. I, I cannot hear you, uh, but yeah. He says that's just BP. Okay, maybe, yeah. Okay, one more question. It's more of a comment. Uh, there is a lot of activity in this area now. And I saw recently a talk by Matt Granath, I think Scotland or UK, let's say somewhere in the UK. His group has a paper exactly on this kind of problem, but with um, a data-driven approach. And their graph neural networks actually work really, really well. I think they tested them on some spe specialized uh, data sets from Microsoft, from other companies. So I suggest you take a look at that paper. I think it's called Data-Driven Quantum Error Correction. Matt Granath is the uh, senior author. They don't combine BP with G GNNs, and they still get some good results pretty good results. And uh, they can handle idle qubits, they can handle a lot of different, uh, uh, you know, types of problems in the uh, quantum error correction circuits that you cannot a priori model and know about. So it, it seems like a promising direction to use these graph neural networks, but you just have to be careful in terms of how do you how you apply them. Yeah, uh, good comment. Questions? Yeah. I had a quick question about the fine tuning. Um, do you worry at all that when you're fine tuning on these higher air ones that you're going to hurt your performance for the more typical cases? Or did you see any of that? It seems like it just gets better, but I'm assuming you're training more on the harder cases in the fine tuning part. So we haven't observed it, but yeah, it's that's always a problem, right? It could 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 be, yeah. Uh, but but we haven't observed this this degradation in the higher, um, yeah, error rate region. I'm not sure if is it would it be a problem in, in practice. Maybe you optimize for a specific region anyhow. So yeah, yeah. I don't know. I'm just curious. Okay, great. Or you mix some samples. That could be also a solution. You have fifty percent from the. Standard cases, 50% from the hard to decode cases, things like that. 